I lately went upstairs and perceived that the curtain, which was generally drawn completely over a glass door, left a little opening on one side. I know not what curiosity impelled me to look through. A tall and very slender lady, most symmetrically formed and most splendidly attired, sat in the room by a little table on which she had laid her arms, her hands being folded together. She sat opposite to the door, so that I could not completely see her angelic countenance. She did not appear to see me, and indeed there was something fixed about her eyes, as if, I might almost say, she had no power of sight. It seemed to me that she was sleeping with her eyes open. I felt very uncomfortable, and therefore I slunk away into the auditorium which was close at hand. Afterwards I learned that the form I had seen was that of Spallanzani's daughter Olympia, whom he kept confined in a very strange and improper manner, so that no one could approach her. After all, there may be something the matter with her. She is silly, perhaps, or something of the kind. But why should I write you all this? I could have conveyed it better and more circumstantially by word of mouth. Know that I shall see you in a fortnight. I must again behold my dear, sweet, angelic Clara. The ill humour will then be dispersed, which, I must confess, has endeavoured to get the mastery over me since that fatal, sensible letter. Therefore, I do not write to her today. A thousand greetings, etc. And also, there's a doppelganger element, isn't there? Yeah, because apparently, uh, the, is it is it that he thinks that uh, the, the hero Nathanael thinks that uh, Coppelius is actually Coppello or something like that? There is a, a sort of thing when he tend to say, oh, he is the copy of this person, or there is a something like that. Oh. If I tell you, my dear friend, that the barometer dealer was the accursed Coppelius himself, you will not blame me for regarding a phenomenon so unpropitious as boding some heavy calamity. He was dressed differently, but the figure and features of Coppelius are too deeply imprinted in my mind for an error in this respect to be possible. Besides, Coppelius has not even altered his name. As I hear, he gives himself out as a Piemontese optician and calls himself Giuseppe Coppola. I am determined to cope with him and to avenge my father's death, be the issue what it may. Tell my mother nothing of the hideous monster's appearance. Remember me to my dear sweet Clara, to whom I will write in a calmer mood. Farewell. And it's complex. It has, you know, a lot of layers. So it starts off with the eyes. Then you get the main character, Nathaniel. He's had this horrific incident with his father being murdered by this Coppelius character. So the Sandman is the, the doppelganger of Coppelius. Is that right? That's what, I, yeah, that's what I remember because there is a moment he goes to study at the university and he falls in love with this girl, and he realizes Coppelius yeah. is her father, and he said, he looks like Coppelius. There you go. But his name is now Coppola. Ah, Coppola, yes, Coppola. Yeah, so that's the doppelganger. Is that Which right? Of Dr. Caligari, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, with the, you know, do you remember the end of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the twist in the end? But when you realize that actually they're all in an asylum, Oh my God! Yeah, I, f I had one of the that. doctors looks like Caligari, and he said he he he, he takes me for the mystical ca mystical uh, Caligari, but you actually don't know if they were really uh, met afterwards, and yeah. that Caligari is hiding as a doctor, or if it's actually yeah. all in the minds of the man itself. So again, it's this could be another influence from Hoffman is is the the, the cabinet of Caligari, right? I I wonder because it has this sort of twist, in a way when you don't know actually because that's the thing on the Sun Man, even if you have the correspondence, you're not even sure if Nathaniel invented everything or if he has a vision, you know. Oh, a little bit like Turn of the Screw. You're never quite sure. Is the governess making up the whole story? Did she really witness a children being possessed by spirits or not? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah so it's another of those. Hmm. Hmm. Strange. So you have that whole backstory of the childhood, and then he grows up, Nathaniel goes to university, sees this doll 
but she, he thinks he, she's human. He sees this girl. She sits motionless at the window. And his sweetheart, Clara, meanwhile, he, he sort of forgets about her. Yeah. And then it, he meets the so-called supposed father of this girl, Olympia, who gives him a telescope or sells him a telescope. So you've got telescope, eyes, glasses. Yes. Coppola sells glasses, doesn't he? Indeed. Yes. So again, you've got all of this thing about vision, perception going on. At last it struck him that he would make the gloomy foreboding that Coppelius would destroy his happiness in love the subject of a poem. He represented himself and Clara as united by true love, but occasionally it seemed as though a black hand darted into their life and tore away some newly springing joy. At last, while they were standing at the altar, the hideous Coppelius appeared and touched Clara's lively eyes. They flashed into Nathaniel's heart like bleeding sparks, scorching and burning, when Coppelius caught him and flung him into the flaming fiery circle, which flew round with the swiftness of the stream and carried him along with it amid its roaring. The roar is like that of the hurricane, when it fiercely lashes the foaming waves, which, like black giants with white heads, rise up for the furious combat. But through the wild tumult he hears Clara's voice. Can you not then see me? Coppelius has deceived you. Those, indeed, were not my eyes which so burned in your breast. They were glowing drops of your own heart's blood. I have my eyes still. Only look at them. Nathaniel reflects. That is Clara, and I am hers for ever. Then it seems to him as though thought forcibly entered the fiery circle, which stands still while the noise dully ceases in the dark abyss. Nathaniel looks into Clara's eyes, but it is only death that, with Clara's eyes, kindly looks on him. Then there's this whole obsession with Olympia. Yeah, and there is also the the correspondence, in a way, because if you read the short story again, you see the letters from all the characters. This divergence of point of view. So in a way, it's like the vision of the Sandman becomes blurry, either for the, the reader or for all the characters. Oh, nice. Because yeah. from one character to another, uh, no one is, you're not sure as the reader who is actually right. Oh, the unreliable narrators. They're all unreliable. Yeah, you're like, oh my God, so did he really live there? Or did he, you know, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. So you've got, again, perception, vision. Then it's the big discovery is made when he's sort of gone very far in. You know, he's quite obviously courting this girl, and then it turns out, yes, yeah, she's an automaton. She's a doll, a dummy, a robot, all the rest of it. Yeah. And he collapses, basically, has this nervous breakdown. You think, oh, well, now it's, it's all going to be sorted. He's going to recover, and they'll live happily ever after. But no, because he still has the telescope that Coppola gave him, and he, 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 he looks through the telescope. So again, we have this distorted vision, perception... The two lovers stood arm in arm in the highest gallery of the tower and looked down upon the misty forests, behind which the blue mountains were rising like a gigantic city. Look there at that curious little grey bush, which actually seems as if it were striding towards us, said Clara. Nathaniel mechanically put his hand into his breast pocket. He found Coppola's telescope and he looked on one side. Clara was before the glass. There was a convulsive movement in his pulse and veins. Pale as death, he stared at Clara, but soon streams of fire flashed and glared from his rolling eyes, and he roared frightfully like a hunted beast. Then he sprang high into the air, and in the intervals of a horrible laughter shrieked out in a piercing tone, Wooden doll, turn thyself! Seizing Clara with immense force, he wished to hurl her down, but with the energy of a desperate death struggle, she clutched the railings. Lothair heard the raging of the madman. He heard Clara's shriek of agony. Fearful forebodings darted through his mind. He ran up. The door of the second flight was fastened, and the shrieks of Clara became louder and louder. Frantic with rage and anxiety, he dashed against the door, which at last burst open. Clara's voice became fainter and fainter. Help! Help! Save me! With these words the voice seemed to die in the air. She is gone! Murdered by the madman! cried Lothair. 
The door of the gallery was also closed, but despair gave him a giant strength, and he burst it from the hinges. Heavens! Clara, grasped by the mad Nathaniel, was hanging in the air over the gallery. Only with one hand she still held one of the iron railings. Quick as lightning, Lothair caught his sister, drew her in, and at the same moment struck the madman in the face with his clenched fist, so that he reeled and let go his prey. And he ends up going mad again, and goes over and, and falls to his death. He, he... Yeah. It's horrific. It's loaded with horror. It's got so much gothic sensibility, shall we say, in it. And the, there is this fall into madness. Like the yes. crying at the end, pretty eyes, pretty eyes. Like <gasps> like the Sandman actually does this. Uh, this sort of turn round. There is this sort of turnover. Well, like a bookend or a mirror, mirror image of the beginning. Yeah, there is a lot you write about this play, about mirrors, uh, doppelgangers, glasses, um, looking glass and all that, the eyes. Yeah, yeah. And I like that point you made about the fall into madness and the physical fall at the end, uh, you know, which, some, which puts an end to Nathaniel, but it's it's again this reference to falling into falling to death falling into madness falling into illusion falling yeah the fall i'm gonna read this uh story again yeah this has been a while i haven't read it but it's yeah see, see, really see how it could be done actually it could be good if we do an adaptation of the time but then it could be good to see how in a directing way I would love to do it in audio, to be fair, but there is a, it's a lot related to vision as well. But I think that's that's doable. That's not. You can achieve so much with sound as well as narration. So it's, you know, that should be doable. There is a, a movie. I haven't seen it and I have to order the DVD when I. Uh, but um, it's uh, a movie of the K brothers. And oh. it was produced by Terry Gilliam. And uh, it's called uh, The Piano Turner. Keenan's Earthquake. I have that one. I have it. Is it um, good? It's, I love it. It's brilliant. I referenced it in my first year of MA in film. Mm -hmm. It's just a lovely, lovely, it's just wonderful. I mean, it's, it's eerie and it's unsettling and it's quite, but the visuals are so wonderful. I love the, the work of the Keys Brothers. From what I could heard from the story, it's it's all of this as well, like playing with automatons, being bring life. Yes, in a way. Yeah, it's, it's very Hoffman. It's also very Hoffman. Because for me, I remember the the trailer with these uh, twisted uh, automatons, like yeah, functioning. One who yeah. was you know chopping wood. Uh, another one who was moving, you know, or dancing or something like that. Yeah. And you yeah. have uh, this evil man played by uh, the the diseased Godfrey John, like with his strange dark uh, eyes, like. Yeah. And I remember yeah. the sentence he said. He's he's like Malvina Nightingale. You will sing forever in my cage. Yes. Yeah. It's it's visually beautifully dreamy. It is very, I think, very surreal. I think it's been, you know, held up as being one of the, the sort of big. But it's it's kind of one of these almost hidden masterpieces. It's like not, I don't know whether it's underappreciated or it, it it should be out there, you know. It should be more easily available. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, I will um, find it. It's a sleeping classic, I think. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's brilliant. Yeah, there is a lot, I think, about the, the Sandman. And it's probably the first one of Hoffman I've ever read. And it's actually quite frightening. And it was really well written yeah. I mean, on the time being. I mean, it's a short story. It packs a lot, though, doesn't it? But it's still within... There is an, a way, a very smart way about giving you the impression, because we don't know actually what looks the Sandman. Uh, you have a sort of view, 
uh, not a view, but uh, the feeling that the child, you know, as Nath Nathaniel is at the end of the story, uh, you know, we don't have a clear description. It's like Jekyll and Hyde, basically. You know, you, you don't know how it looks. You just know that he is uncanny, that he is... Uh, There's something off, yeah. Monstrous. There is something monstrous. Something, yes, yes. People can't put a pin, can't pin it down, but they, they have this feeling of utter revulsion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, another influence. He's, in, you know, he influenced... He, he may well have influenced uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. I don't know if he was a if Louis Stevenson was an Hoffman uh, reader. I don't know, but he surely might have been familiar with it. I wonder. Mm. We'll have to see if we can find a connection. I think I did look that up. Mr. Hoffman. <sighs> Come in, Mr. Hoffman. <coughs> I use... oh, here we go, here we go. Opening words, Robert Louis Stevenson was harking back to his readings of Hoffman when he created Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Let's have a look. Oh, my God. You see, there what was an influence. I thought there was, yeah. Influenced also by Dickens and Edgar Allan Poe, but... Um... Oh, my God, we could do an entire book or even an entire documentary about how all these authors influence each other. Well, it is, it's, it's, it is fascinating. It's, it's, you keep finding connections. <laughs> the doppelganger theme also pops up in Hoffman's novella, The Devil's Elixirs. Medardos, the main character, encounters his half-brother, the Count, who transforms into a lunatic double, pursuing and crossing Medardos at various points throughout the story. Around 20 years later, Edgar Allan Poe wrote William Wilson, whose central theme is the double that haunts the main character from school onwards. This was followed by Dostoevsky's The Double in 1846. Poe stated he owed the idea of his story to Washington Irving's unwritten drama of Lord Byron. Yet it has also been suggested that William Wilson shares much with Hoffman's doppelgangers. The American author has adopted also Hoffman's idea of the personification of the two powers in a man's soul. Medardus's double, Victorin, is the personified incorporated principle of evil. William Wilson's double, on the other hand, is the living embodiment of the good principle. Both authors expressly state as much. Poe has taken this idea from Hoffman, but in so doing he has inverted it. William Wilson's double is an agent of the good. Medardus's double, Victorin, serves the power of evil. Palmer Cobb, the influence of E.T.A. Hoffman on the tales of Edgar Allan Poe, Studies in Philology, Volume 3, 1908. Dostoevsky's double, meanwhile, was compared unfavourably with Poe's tale by Thomas Mann, who said that it by no means improved on Edgar Allan Poe's William Wilson, a tale that deals with the same old romantic motif in a way far more profound on the moral side and more successfully resolving the critical in the poetic. The doppelganger remained a popular element in Gothic romantic literature, surfacing again in Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde and it seems not improbable that Stevenson had read Hoffman. OK, so this article says it's possible Robert Louis Stevenson was harking back to his readings of Hoffman, but the suggestion is, yes, Stevenson read Hoffman. Oh, you're going to laugh. There is, uh, in 1991, Der Sandman oh. is the basis of a stop-motion animation film, The Sandman, created by Paul Berry and nominated for an Oscar. And in 2000, there is a, The Sandman, a dance film made by the K Brothers and uh, William oh, Puckett, yes. which is loosely based on Etier Hoffman's story. Loosely, but yes, I think uh, that does ring a bell. What was the, the animation one? Because there was the... It's called Der Sandman in mm. German, like... So if I click on this, and if I put 1991, funny enough, it's got an Oscar, but I never heard of it. 
not even as a reference well the sandman turns up as a cute little non-speaking cartoon in one of these 3d animations i think oh yes uh, the, seven, uh, the um, guardians of the, the guardian oh i try to remember there is father christmas there is the two fairy hang on is it legend legend of the guardians yes yeah 2010 is that possible i think so i think this is the one because you have the sun man who doesn't speak or actually when he speaks he's like um and he he has this lovely way of um he whirls up into the air and when he thinks or when he wants to speak, actually, the sand he, ha the sand he has forms, uh, you know, some interjections, logo or drawings just to express himself. Yes. The, the rise of the Guardian. Oh, that was it. I love that movie. Wasn't there the Easter Bunny in there? Jack Frost, Easter yeah, Bunny, indeed. North, yes. Tooth Fairy... Yeah, it was DreamWorks, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. That was a nice one. Full of curiosity to hear more of this Sandman and his particular connection with children, I at last asked the old woman who tended my youngest sister what sort of man he was. Eh, hey, Natty, said she. Do you not know that yet? He is a wicked man who comes to children when they will not go to bed and throws a handful of sand into their eyes. So they start out bleeding from their heads. These eyes he puts in a bag and carries them to the half-moon to feed his own children, who sit in the nest up yonder and have crooked beaks like owls with which they may pick up the eyes of the naughty human children. How did he get from the Sandman puts people to sleep and inspires beautiful dreams by sprinkling magical sand? How did Hoffman get to, now he comes and takes the children's eyes and takes them to the moon to feed his children? How did he get there? How did he do I don't that? Know. I only feel there, there is no I I can't find sources from there, and uh, I'm like probably a friend is like oh I'm gonna make him bad so I think he wanted just to twist the character in itself in its essence. It's Frank Corelli. It's from the opera. That makes more sense. Though. But where did he get these ideas from? Basically, yeah, he had to give the main character this overwhelming horror connected with lenses, eyes. The eyes have it. <laughs> the eyes. Eyes. Oh. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning, the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. When, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open, it breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. Hoffman and Mary Shelley, they share the same timeline. They are contemporaries. Oh, true! You're right. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, she's a teenager. He's going to, like, die a couple of years later. When did he die again? 1820? Yeah, roughly. And yeah. he was 46 years old. That's right. So, okay, and she's basically barely out of her teens. Um, but it, 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 she's still already, they both writing. They both write at the same time. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein barely two years after Hoffman's Sandman was published. It seems likely she was at least familiar with the story. Both authors share similar elements and themes. Both explore madness and hybrids in their work. In Hoffman's The Sandman, madness is woven into the narrative through Nathaniel's psychological descent. The story blurs the lines between reality and fantasy, emphasizing the subjective nature of perception. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein delves into madness through the character of Victor Frankenstein, the creator of the monster. 
Victor's ambition and relentless pursuit of scientific knowledge lead him down a path of moral and psychological deterioration. The Sandman introduces the theme of hybrids through the character of Olympia, the doll created by the sinister Coppelius. Olympia blurs the distinction between the human and the mechanical and serves as a focal point for Nathaniel's delusions, symbolizing the unsettling intersection of reality and artificiality. In Frankenstein, the hybrid creation is the monster himself. Victor Frankenstein's scientific experiment results in the creature that is a hybrid of various human body parts. The creature grapples with its identity and the rejection it faces from society due to its grotesque appearance. In both works, madness and the creation of hybrids serve as powerful literary devices to explore the dark aspects of human nature, the consequences of unchecked ambition and the blurred boundaries between the real and the fantastical. I mean, okay, Frankenstein didn't make a doll. Well, he made a human doll, didn't he? He thought he would... He didn't, he, I think he didn't know what he was going to do with it when it came to life. He was just eaten up with the ambition of, of making it come to life. Yeah, and he wasn't and he wasn't sure how he was going to do it because when you read the chapter, you realize that he didn't expect it to be alive in a way because he he, he runs away from fear when he sees it. Yeah, it's totally... The other of it is that he's afraid of his own creation. Yeah. Have you seen The Creature on Netflix? Uh, is that a recent film? Yes, it's just been out quite recently. Yeah, it's a Turkish adaptation. It's, it's, it is Frankenstein, but it's set in Turkey, in Constantinople. And uh, Yeah, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, if you get a chance, I think you, you'll find it really amazing. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, I, I love it because the way it delves into it brings, it sets it in 19th century Turkey, but I think it's 1890s. So it's a little bit later. It's not it's not 1820s. I think it's a little bit, you know, it's closer down the line. But oh. it's it's beautifully done, I thought. I thought it was such a well done dramatization. I would say it outdoes quite a few Western adaptations wow yeah it's got it's got a feel about it they, they they've done something it's very it has a lot of integrity did you found it like as close uh, to the novel actually perhaps very yeah. how do you say um uh, close to the material the base material i would say even closer than other adaptations that have been made recently that's what I mean by I, there's a feeling of integrity about it. It's got that. I don't know if it's it's bringing in Turkish mythology because there's a book involved. I'm not sure if that's based on you know a specific mythology or whether that was invented for the purpose of the for the series. I don't watch it because I know there is the legend of you know all the ghouls like in the Turkish stories you know the undead rising up. Have a look at it and see what you think, because it's it's kind of brilliant, I think. Okay. I found it very gripping in the way that other film adaptations simply are not. <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. And maybe because it's a series, so you can you you're given that chance to get drawn into it, to build, yeah. you know, build a feeling and a relationship with the, the characters. Because that makes it a lot longer than a film, and I couldn't stop watching it. It was I found it highly addictive. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. well, uh, we'll look this then. Have a look at it. Have a look. I think it's just called Creature on Netflix. Creature. Um, yeah, it was extremely well done. Okay. Yeah, um, that just that whole the feeling of how they set it in the Turkish society and culture of the time. And uh, that that was in itself fascinating, you know, as so you got you get the two together, you get the story, plus you get a, this completely different setting. And it, it's just yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely not Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs>